Gordon White got it under control and drilled in a low shot from the edge of the box. Smith at full stretch to make the save. Max Wright sent in a cross met by Greenhill again. But Graham Smith pulling off a great save to deny the Shire. Hi everybody, welcome to Shaky Sports Journeys. Um, gone back, I've been doing a lot of cricket recently uh, and I've dived back into the into the football world. It's a, it's a pleasure to be joined by uh, Mr. Graham Smith, a.k.a. Schmiddy from Rangers. How are you, sir? I'm very well, thanks for having me. Good man, good man. Uh, how's, uh, how's life been recently then? You must have been, uh, obviously, you know, first time we touched base with each other, it was a mutual, mutual uh, introduction through big Graham McLaren, a uh, good friend of mine. I believe uh, you've been pals with him for a few years yourself now. Yeah, I just, f friends were kind of late teens, early 20s, and then uh, obviously we've kind of, both grew up and matured at the same time as we've both got kids that are similar ages and stuff. So, uh, yeah, and, and him being a Celtic fan, which is unusual, but uh, nah, he's, a, he's a good big fella, so he uh, likes his cricket and his football. So, yeah, good lad. No, no, he's, a, he's, a, he's a top man and I appreciate, appreciate the introduction. So, what I want to do today, is it alright to call you Smiddy? No I problem at all. I on your Twitter, you're calling I know the person that does call me Smiddy's the wife and the kids. <laughs> uh, so, born. 3rd of October 1982 uh, in lovely Bells Hill. Talk to me about what was it like growing up in, uh, in Bells Hill? What was your childhood? Well, I'm, I'm actually an Aird, I'm actually Airdrie born and bred. That was the closest hospital, but uh, yeah, I've been an Airdrie man all my days. Uh, saying I've never moved away too far for the family home. I've moved about a, a fair bit as I've got older from house to house, just with the kids getting older and stuff, but I've never kind of moved away for Airdrie. It's, it's a place that had opportunities at times, but never happened, so I've always kind of been lucky enough that any of the clubs I've played for, I've been able to kind of base myself here and just travel. So it's been, uh, yeah, it's been good. Good stuff, good stuff. So growing up, you know, when did you, when did you start? When did football, football in the family, or uh, you know, is it was it something? That, you know, what? When did you start kicking the ball and realizing you were good at it? Uh, I can, I remember I, as early as I can remember. I've always had the ball. Uh, I've got an older brother, David, who. Uh, he's three years older than me, so he was a centre forward. So I think that was how I ended up making the transition into goals. I was getting the wee, the younger brother was getting papped in the goals, getting shots at him. But uh, my dad, massive Rangers fan, massive Scotland fan, uh, as as were the rest of my family. Uh, and as I say, just having an older brother, just always had a ball. I, I, I can't remember being into anything else, uh, being into BMXs or skateboards or anything. I just any any spare time I had, I just always the football. And as I say. I think that was partly with my dad and my uncles and stuff and, and my brothers rubbing off on me. They say I've been a, a, a big big Rangers family for a long time uh, and, and big Airdrie fans as well. Some of my family as well who have moved to different places in the world but they've always kept their Scottish roots and, the, and the, they've always been diamonds as such. So yeah, it's just been, as I say, any time I can remember I always did football. I was just obsessed with football and that was that was all I ever done. <laughs> yeah, because kids these days, somebody too concerned with computer games and uh, sitting in front of a TV screen. I think you know, back back in my uh, uh, childhood, like, like yourself, it was all outdoors. I would like yeah. to see more kids putting uh, putting jumpers down and seeing a game of football going on here and there. You don't you don't see as much of it anymore. Yeah, I think. I mean, it's like anything else. I can always remember. I don't know how many f how many neighbours' fences and hedges I broke through kicking the ball, and how many council lampposts I broke through probably missing the target right enough, but all these things, whereas now you never really see anybody be a front fence or a front garden and kids are too easy probably now, they've got far more options and technology is a massive thing, I mean I've got a 10 year old and an 8 year old who, funnily enough, they're away at their football tonight, but, but they're training tonight, but it's again, it's kids, they'd rather pick up a TV remote or a, or a joystick now than, than pick up a football or any or any other sort of ball, uh, and as I say, the facilities that, that are there now are are kind of few and far between as well. I know it's getting better in terms of the council trying to put stuff in, but uh, it's certainly different from when obviously when I was younger. And as I say, we only had outdoors. I mean, you went out and you, your mum and dad, I'm not saying they didn't bother about you, but you, you were out till you get shouted for your dinner. And then after your dinner, you were in quick getting your dinner and then you wanted back out till, till, it, was, till it was bedtime. And that was and the, the same pattern just repeated every single day. Uh, but as I say, probably got far more choices and probably far more worldly wise now, uh, uh, a lot of them with all the different stuff they watch, but uh, yeah, it's just it's just a sign of times, that's just the way it is, but even at the start of lockdown, I'm trying to keep mine off technology, 
and yet all the homework's on iPads and it's on computers and it's PDFs this and I'm just like, what happened to a pen and a bit of paper and a jotter? But it's just the way it is now, I suppose. Yeah, no, it is, it is. But, you know, it's important to keep keep that old-fashioned. You know, it's great to hear that your boys are away, away at football training just now. So I'm sure that, I'm sure you keep you, you keep a fine balance between technology and, you know, them keeping fit and look, looking after themselves as well. So I heard a rumour that you didn't always start as a goalkeeper. I know you said your brother patched you in the goals early doors, but were you, were you fond of playing outfield to begin with? Uh, yeah, I did. I actually, the kind of... When I was there, it was under 10 was the kind of first age group you ever got, and it wasn't obviously as formalised and it wasn't as kind of organised as what it is now in terms of, I mean, you had guys that were printers, electricians and everything else that took young young teams and they didn't have coaching badges then, there was just guys that facilitated training and games and, and these guys did great in terms of, their, uh, in terms of like obviously coaching kids and putting things together and fundraising and everything, but my brother being under 10 when he played, so I was always kind of three years below. I was just always kicking the ball about the side of the pitch. And then all of a sudden, they kind of seen that I was no half decent and I got a wee 10 minutes here and a wee 20 minutes there. And then, so I ended up playing kind of two years above myself for a lot of time, which obviously helped as well. But yeah, I was a kind of centre midfielder stroke. Uh, I think the slower I go, I went back to sweeper. And then I couldn't go any further back than in the goal. So uh, I think that's how it kind of hanged me. But yeah, I didn't actually... My first proper season in goals would probably been about I would have been about fourteen or fifteen, so I was quite a late bloomer in terms of that. But uh, I mean, no, no, a lot of people have said to me over the years that my distribution from both both uh, feet was 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 one of the things that, that, that stood out, and I, and I think that played a massive part in actually being an outfielder. And kind of even when I got older, I'd still the odd time if I was allowed in the summer, I would go and play five a sides with my pals and seven a sides, and I would never ever play in goals because I just you know, I say a lot of goalkeepers are, are frustrated at fielders, but I was never really like that. I just loved playing football, as I say, and then the, the, the chance for me to go in goals. And then when I went in goals, actually, there was actually more a chance. I thought, well, I've got a chance of being professional here. So, as I say, it just kind of stuck for there. And then the kind of the guys who used to idolise as outfield players, he started to wean more towards the goalkeeping guys. So, that was just kind of how it evolved for there. But as I say, it all comes out of that bit where he just wanted to play all the time. So, uh, it was a kind of yeah, late transition, probably, compared to a lot of other people. Yeah, well, interesting, interesting. Join Kilmarnock Boys Club in 2000. You, you, can, you, can you remember that? Yeah, I can. Uh, I'd actually been playing with kind of Rangers Supporters Association, who uh, my, my dad had tel- helped take a few of the teams. And I mean, we had an unbelievable team then. We had kind of like some myself, Stephen Hughes, Stephen Doby, uh, obviously guys who went on to play in the first team. We had young, John Rankin as well, who who's only just retired there, had a great career as well. Uh, and then obviously my dad went back the way and started taking like to Scott Fox and Graham Dorans and guys like that in his team. So as I say, although he didn't have his badges, didn't have else, so him and his assistant manager, uh, a guy called Alec Donaldson who sadly passed away. Uh, as I say, they were they were one of the major influences in in, in me growing up, and they, they taught me a lot as as not just a footballer but as a person as well. And as I say, I've st- I still try to instill their values that they instilled in me all, all these years later. Uh, and as I say, that that was that was the bit that, that that we got to in terms of, as I say, just just being a good guy. And, and as I say, uh, then as I say, for the, for there, uh, I kind of got released for Rangers about fifteen. So I spent I spent a season at uh, Air United, and then I had an opportunity to go. I think it was a tournament in Sweden, and then Kilmarnock came in and asked me to go to the Milk Cup, and I went and, and I played every. I played most most minutes in most games and did quite well. Again, it was a, it was a tournament that was probably a year above me or two years above me, uh, but I handled myself okay. And then after that, the the, the kind of contract talk started. So I had a year at under sixteens. Uh, fun enough, I was quite fortunate in terms of the the full time goal at the time, the apprentice goal at the time. He was under eighteen. He broke his foot or he broke his ankle during about the January time. So in actual fact, I got to play kind of. Saturday with the, the under 18s and Sunday with the under 16s for, for kind of six months just before I went full time. So again, kind of quite fortunate the day things kind of went for me as well, uh, and obviously kind of sped up my development as such. But uh, it was uh, yeah, good times. I say a lot of time. Come on, great, absolute great club. Really enjoyed my time there. Oh, yeah. and I, I say it was a fantastic upbringing in football. When you look at your career. There's two main clubs that stand out. It's, it's interesting to hear you say that. You know, you obviously. Yeah, you, we're going to touch on it. You had you had a you had a nice nice spell at Rangers, but Kilmarnock is a club that you kind of you have some you have a couple of spells at. 
So you, I mean, are you, you, you're very, very, very thankful for the time that you had with that with Kilmarnock, good club. Yeah, said. great, great upbringing, great coaches. As I say, great family club. Really looked after me. Uh, and as I say, a couple of loan spells while I was there, ended up being there eight years in total, but I just felt as if I got to a period, as I say, with a great youth team, with loads of great players come through and played for the first team, Stephen Naismiths, Chris Boyd, guys like that, uh, probably, there are obviously many others that, that, that uh, I've probably no mentioned, but uh, as I say, the, we had a great upbringing, I wouldn't have, wouldn't have swapped it for the world, it was tough, it was tough, certainly different from what the guys are used to now, young, young, the young apprentices are used to now, but uh, I wouldn't swap it for the world. It was it was the making of me a man as a player, and it was it was one of the reasons that I probably uh, played for for the, the, the amount of time that I did. Uh, and as I say, instilled the values in me, and and just learned the game. And as I say, that allied with a couple of loan spells, and and I thought that when when I got to a point of of kind of being a number one as such and pushing them in, there was different circumstances. Obviously, kind of I had, I had a stuttering stuttering period of trying to. Not really sustaining a lot of games. It was kind of in and out, in and out through various different things. So as I say, I just decided to leave. Uh, but as I say, no, I thoroughly enjoyed my time. I come out a great club. Can't speak highly enough of the place. Yeah, good to hear. Am I right saying then loan to Queens Park? Um, two thousand. You had a spell. Two thousand one to two thousand two. Went went over to Lesser. Was it still? Would they would they have played it? Played yeah, it was still. It was still Hamden at that time. Uh, it was again just weird circumstances how that came about. I think the first team were playing Queen's Park in a pre season friendly and Bobby Williamson, the manager, I think Queen's Park goalie had been injured the week before or the day before and Bobby Williamson came up to me and he says, uh, uh, he kinda of asked me politely, I kinda of, do you want a game for Queen's Park? I think it was more of a test. It was a kinda of, well you're playing whether you like it or no. But uh Again, just going back to that bit, I just lo wanted to play football. It was bit, it was good going to play against the first team players, so playing against guys like Ian Durant, Ali McCoy, stuff like that. So I said, of course I want to play. Uh, I think I ended up getting beat 4 or 5 nil. but th the manager at the time of Queen's Park, I was only 18 at the time, the manager for the Queen's Park, John McCormick, had seen enough of me in that game and said, look, we want to take you in loan for the season, which is obviously, I was getting to that period where I, my kind of, my time with the youth team was finishing. I was looking towards kind of getting that transition into the first team, so it was ideal. It fitted all, uh, it, 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 it fitted everybody. It fitted the bill. So as I say, it was, it was a, a really enjoyable experience. It was tough bits again. There was tough bits within that season. There was there was good bits and bad bits again. Learning about the game, learning about yourself as well in terms of how you deal with pressure, how you deal with mistakes, how you deal with, with, with things going well. And and as I say, it was just again. The, the first two loans that I had were, were pivotal and for me playing for so long again. It was it was something that I certainly encourage our, our young goalkeepers to do now. Just a question I've got for you. You know, goalkeepers is a is a kind of a different is a different breed. You know, he's a between the posts. You're kind of separated a lot of the time from you know what's what what's going on and what's going on in the pitch. You're not not separated, but you know you're expected to to, to save goals. What what is it a different type of pressure if you make a bundle? And you, like, I know in cricket, if you drop a catch, you've got 10 guys who may not be saying anything to you, but they're all kind of giving you that look like, mate, you dropped an important catch there. What is it like as a goalkeeper when you, punt, you know, drop one out of the hands and somebody pops it in, or you, you should save one or catch it and you, you put it down and something, you know, what, what's the, is, is it must be a different type of pressure. Yeah, again, I mean, it's handling that pressure is, is, is whether you're successful or not, because as we've noted, I mean, throughout time, the goalkeepers at the top level still make mistakes as well. And as I say, probably even happen kind of more now in the big games because the amount of cameras there is, there's no hiding place and goalkeepers spend a lot more of their training week working on ball at their feet because they're, they're wanting to be a, an 11th man, and etc. So as I say, even the fact that sometimes you get the wee bit of the fundamentals that have came away and, and probably don't work on it as much. So again, the guys that are successful, the guys that handle it, I mean, I've, I've said this a million times, the, the, the mental pressure that a goalkeeper is under is totally different to for, for a striker. A striker can a striker can in, in train all week and, and go out and miss 10 chances. A goalkeeper can't do that at the other end because, as I say, the, the likelihood is, if, unless he's got a, good, a right good manager that likes him, he's not going to be playing the next week. And as I say, that's just, that's just part and parcel of it. That's... That that is what kind of separates goalkeepers from everybody else, and it's the old saying where if a centre forward gives the ball away, there's there's ten players behind them, and if midfielders give it away, there's five players behind them. If, if the defenders give it away, etc. etc. But see, that's just the life of a goalkeeper. It's 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 just weird. It's that's just, that's just football where you 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 have a great game and lose three goals, and yet you could have a poor game where nothing comes your way, and 
the wee fumbles that you make get cleared and you end up getting clean sheets and it's just it's just bizarre, that's just football. But as I say, that, that bit of going to Queen's Park and, and playing first team football in front of a real crowd is was certainly different from playing under eighteens when you're playing in front of you're only really playing in front of mums and dads and, and maybe one man and his dog at the side, whereas you go and play although Queen's Park you're maybe only playing in front of five thousand eh, five hundred, sorry. But again it's that bit of you've got people constantly behind your goal one half telling you you're great and then when you go up the away end and everybody's telling you you're rubbish no matter what you do. So it's just handling that pressure and handling that kinda that 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 real bit, uh, as I say, is what what kind of determines whether you're going to be successful. No, I, I, I think. Well, that's good. That's good. Good to hear your your mindset on that. I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about it later. But obviously, you you pass this knowledge on to the younger lads now, so this must be quite a lot of the stuff that that comes up. But we will, we will touch on that. You know, but you, you you went on, you played again. You know, sorry, 2003. Um, you had a spell with Stenhouse Muir. Um, you started 34 games there. So how was how was your spell? How was your spell there? It's kind of strikes me as you know you were you were really learning your trade right now. Yeah, again, it's some similar something similar that that I try and do with and almost like tee it up and level it up because when I was playing with Queens Park, it was the old second division at the time, which is a uh, sorry old third division at the time, which was League Two now. Uh, and then the next year when I went to Stenhouse Muir, it was it was the second division, which is obviously League One. So it was just just building up the, building up the standards, and as I say, just keeping up the levels as such. And as I say, best preparing myself for for trying to get in the command at first team because at that point in time, that was all I wanted to do was get in and, and make a name for myself in the first team. But I was understanding of where I was in the kind of the pecking order or the layer cake, whatever you want to call it. And as I say. You've got to go out and get your, but rather than play with the youth team or or sit and train and sit on a bench, I wanted to go out and 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 get my hands dirty as such and, and say experience as much as I could because it, it's only now that it's only now that you can look back in your career and you think, well, I played for I played for nineteen seasons professionally. I could have extended it longer if I didn't go into coaching. Uh, I think they two or three years when I went alone, they were absolutely pivotal in, in terms of that. And as I say, that they, they were the foundation for me to go and play at various different levels and, and be a number one, a number two, a number three, just at, at various different clubs. So as I say, it gave me that kind of broad knowledge and broad understanding of how hard football really, really is. Because again, it's people on the TV can sit and people in the crowd and people everything else. But until you're actually there and you're in that position, it, it's it's a lot harder than it's a lot harder than than, than it looks uh, at times, and as I say, there's good bits and there's bad bits. But ultimately, the people that handle the pressure the best are the are the people that are successful and play play at a high level. Absolutely. So yeah, you waited a while, but seventh uh, of March two thousand and four, you got your chance. You made your debut for Kilmarnock um, as a sub, I believe, during a one all game with Hearts. Yeah, it was Hearts, I can remember that as well. It was live in the telly. I think it was a Sunday game actually, it was live in the BBC. Uh, and obviously with two strong teams at that time, the SPL was, was strong. Uh, Kelly Kelly were a good squad and so were Hearts. And it was kind of just, uh, I had a few niggly injuries the season before and I'd come in and played a couple of games and then I was out. And then, uh, and obviously, the with the with the, the, the loan, I uh, managed to play about 30 odd games with Stenhouse Muir. So as I say, there was, uh, a couple of injuries that kept me out of squads and stuff, and then all of a sudden uh, it was half time, so I'd kind of finished my, my half time warm up and went in to get a quick drink of juice or whatever it may be, and or, or, or get, a, get get a toilet. And then the next minute, the, the kit man's running down the corridor at Rugby Park, he's screaming, Smithy, Smithy, you need to hurry up. Melly's done his calf. So it was called Melly that was playing, so uh, it was kind of probably good that you, you don't get a chance to think about it. Sometimes that can go for you and against you. Sometimes. People like to th know that they're going to play, or or they uh, or they, they they don't like to think about it. They'd rather get told last minute. But it's just one day once. It, it was what it was. Uh, I come on. Uh, I think I come on now uh, uh, now. Uh, as I say, lost a goal, but uh, had a couple of decent saves. And, and as I say, for 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 a debut to be live on the telly and and get the kind of pats in the back off the gaffer and the assistant manager and the players after the game was good. And as I say, it was it was one of the ones where you just wanted more. You just wanted more and you wanted to stay in that environment. So yeah, that was how it all kinda of kicked off. It's almost a, it's almost a, it's almost a good one because you didn't have the night before to maybe build up the kind of pressure of I'm playing tomorrow, but you know, my first game. You were just kinda of chucked in the deep end, right? You're in yeah, there. I mean that's that again, going back to that mental side, that's every every goalkeeper's different. It's not kinda of one size fits all where some guys like to know 
a couple of days in advance and they like to prepare themselves properly and look at opposition and things like that and obviously that's a massive side of the game now but back then it was kind of I didn't see the point not worrying about stuff like that it was kind of whatever's going to happen is going to happen in the game whether I'm playing whether I'm playing in front of 500 people or 50,000 people I'm still going to have to do the same things to have a, a good game or a successful game so I, I was never one of the ones that kind of worried about what was coming or who I was going to be playing against it was yeah you would look at penalty takers to give yourself a kind of better better idea if something went if a penalty give against you or something like that but you maybe you look at corners especially modern day it's massive the, the kind of analysis but back then it was the old X's and O's on the board and that was your team talk and there was no video clips there was no anything like that it was just you just it was you against them and you had to get the better of your opponent and that was it so as I say yeah it was just one of the things that uh, to, it's, again it's probably a couple of days later when you start reading the papers and you start seeing that oh hold on a minute I'm in the kind of big time as such here now it's no it's no a wee column of two inches in the in, in the Sunday Mail it's you're getting a full spread and it's you're getting rated by obviously again you're getting rated by guys that don't play football but they've got a fair idea so as I say just things like that where you at that such a young age you think yeah this is, this is a bit of me I like this I want more of this oh, quality quality you were part of the uh, the squad as well in the uh, 2007 League Scottish Cup League Scottish League Cup final. You were an unused sub. He's lost five one to Hibs. You know, was uh, was it was that a bit of a was that a bit of a down down? What, what, what was it like in the changing room there? You must be buzzing. The squad must be buzzing to be in a final. You know, and then yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. At the time, the league, the build up was good. I mean, the club did well for us too. As we to St Andrews, I'd actually played all the rounds and I played the quarter final. And then I never played the semi final. Uh, obviously, I was having a dispute about a contract because Alan Cole at the time was was the experienced goalkeeper and he was coming in and doing well. He was sorry, he was he was having like niggly injuries and stuff that was keeping him up for three or four games. So I was coming in doing well, clean sheets, man of the matches, penalty saves, etc. Uh, and as soon as Comer was fit again, he was back in the team. So again, maybe a little bit big time for me I don't know maybe a little bit naive back then but I thought well I've, I, can, I can only get experience through playing uh, so as I say obviously things with the contract didn't work out so I, got, I ended up no playing the semi-final uh, in, in fairness Alan Combe did well Stephen A. Smith was fantastic I think he scored the hat trick uh, and obviously so you're sitting there on the bench for the final but again wanting the boys to do well wanting the boys to win uh, but we were playing a very, very strong Hibs team. Very, very strong Hibs team. Like Sir Kevin Thompson, Scott Brown, uh, Stevie Fletcher, guys like that. So as I say, it was we lost a, a goal for a set play quite early on, and, and, and we never kind of recovered from it. And it was just, it was a tough day. It was a tough day. Uh, and as I say, it was great that we got there. But at the end of the day, when you get there, you've got to win it, and you've got to try and win it. And as I say, we just disappointed that we didn't do that. And and it ended up the scoreline, the scoreline kind of w- was a bit more flattering to Hibs than what probably what the game suggested because we, we did at times make a fist state but as I say they were a very very strong team under John Collins you were doing alright they should have just kept ah, it's, just, that's it's just one of the things you, you learn when you're older that, as I say I, I've, I'd get in the team and I, and I thought I deserved to stay in the team and obviously the manager wanted to go with experience which now I understand that probably when I was younger I didn't uh, because as a player you just look at the You've only got you to look after, and you're a bit. You obviously need to be selfish that way. Uh, now that I'm in the coaching side of, to football, it's. I mean, it's now totally different, and my mindset has changed to a point where you've now got to think of the bigger picture and 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 the team thing and everything else like that. But as I say, it was just one of the things we did. As I say, we did fantastic to get there because uh, we beat beat a couple. There was a couple of difficult games in there, and as I say, just unfortunately the final never went our way. And as I say, it was a, it was a sore score line. 27th of June 2007 must be a day you look back on quite fondly. Very proud moment for the family as well. Um, you signed a, a, a three year deal, I believe, at the time with Glasgow Rangers on a free transfer. Would, that, would, would, would I be right in saying that you came in under Walter Smith? Yeah, yeah. So Walter took over for Paul Leguin just the previous, I think it was in January. So he made a couple of, he made a couple of, uh, he made a couple of, uh, kind of pre-contract signs, I think he signed Kurt Broadfoot, Alan Gow uh, and obviously I was actually a free agent at the time, I was actually a free agent at the time, I was on I was on holiday because again going back to what we just spoke about there about Kilmarnock, uh, I, I decided to leave the club, didn't have, actually have a club, my agent had been spoke, speaking to a few different clubs and 
there was a couple of bit of interest for down south and there was a couple of kind of teams for abroad uh, that, that I kind of looked at as well uh, and then I was on holiday and obviously I got uh, a phone call from my agent at the time who was Dan Jackson uh, and he, he said to me look we've had, we've had uh, Walter Smith on the phone uh, and, and then that was that, it was basically right, do you want me to fly home early, where, where, where do I sign, so uh, as I say, and he's like, no just enjoy your holiday, just keep yourself right, he says it's, it's early stages but obviously I'll, I'll keep in touch and then within a matter of a couple of days we got everything sorted and it was actually a, it was actually a couple of weeks went by where uh, I'd actually signed the contract uh, and there was a couple of weeks went by where obviously they weren't releasing it till pre-season so it was kind of like your mum and dad knew and your brother knew but you weren't allowed to tell them this so that was that was probably harder for them than it was for me yeah. uh, but as I say now nah, it was a proud moment as I say uh, I, 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 I felt as if obviously I, I wanted to go to Rangers and, and play as much as I could but again you go into a bigger club there's, there's stiffer competition there but as I say obviously my 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 performances at the uh, Kilmarnock at the time although it was only maybe 60 or 70 uh, or 60, 50 or 60 games of Kilmarnock uh, obviously, they felt that 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 they wanted it wanted uh, looking at me, and as I say, uh, grateful for Walter for giving me the opportunity to go. And as I say, because I learned a lot for myself again in the years I was there in terms of being professional and and looking after myself. And as I say, obviously being part of a group of international uh, football players, and as I say, everybody had their their different uh, the the languages and, and the different way they looked at football and everything else. So it opened my mind up to stuff like that as well. But as I say, yeah, it was kind of as soon as I heard that Rangers were interested, kind of all the other clubs just went in the back burner because, as I say, my sole focus was right. Let's 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 get cracking. That's, that's a boyhood dream, isn't it? You, you you know, growing up, come from a Rangers family. You know, you want to play for that would have been the dream, I'd imagine. Yeah, again, I mean, it's like loads of other, there's loads of players of. I've kind of went to Rangers and, and, and as I say, the, the, I was disappointed the fact I only played one game that was there. But again, I had, I had international goalkeepers ahead of me in the pecking order. I'm not, I'm not that naive that, that, to know that that was never going to be the case. But you go and you give it your best. And you and as I say, I certainly left a better goalkeeper than than, than I started there uh, through working with these guys every day. And as but I say... Would have been, would have been kind of, Neil Alexander and would have been Alan McGregor as well? A bit well, Alan, Alan had just... Alan, that was Alan's first se- end of Alan's first season. He'd obviously displaced Lionel Letizia who'd left and, and as I say, he'd started to, to play games and then obviously Roy Carroll came in for the first six months. Again, Roy was the same in international football. He was he was frustrated, so after six months, he only played one game. He played the League Cup game that season, the first League Cup game, sorry. Uh, and then obviously left in the January to, to go to, to Derby in the Premier League and and, and again so I, I played the first Scottish Cup game uh, and that obviously ended up being my, my debut and my kind of one and only competitive game it's but it's again well that's a 100% record now clean sheet one game one clean sheet but uh, no, on a serious note as I say again that was just I can remember when I first went to Rangers and, and again Barry Ferguson was great with me and he was pals amazing and we went out for, for lunch and he just sat down and said look here's the expectations here's how it's different for other clubs you've been at and and here's what's expected of you uh, and and again i mean there was one point at rangers where they had uh stephen Kloss, lionel Sherboni, and Anthony niemi all at the club at the one time so again i mean three international goalkeepers with an unbelievable pedigree and yet on a saturday one of them was going to have to sit in the stand he says so again there'll be times where you're number two there'll be times you're number three he says hopefully there's times you're number one and, and again that was that was kind of the, the way it went and that's just how it goes at a big club the competition for places is fierce and Again, we had we had international football players that couldn't go on the bench. That was just that was just the the strength and depth we had at, at the squad in that time. But again, again, wouldn't swap my time there. Wouldn't swap my time there at all. If I even if I even if I knew then if if I knew then that I wasn't going to play a lot of games, I would still probably make the same decision because, as I say, it was it was the club that I grew up supporting as a boy, and and I'd, and I'd always regret if I never never if I never went and never never done my done my bit to try and get in the team and, and be involved and. And the successful squad that I was involved in, as I say, we had two unbelievable campaigns when I was there, uh, won a few trophies, and as I say, uh, obviously it came to a point then it was time for me to go and kind of use the tools that I'd, I'd, I'd uh, or the kind of strings I've got in my bow there to, to good effect by playing again. So as I say, but uh, you really enjoy my time, winning the with the world, and as I say, it's it's my club and it's everybody that knows me knows it's it's Rangers as my team, and and that's that that'll never change. So as I say, that that was. 
too too good to turn down. Well, listen, you mentioned there that you're working with international goalkeeper after international goalkeeper. You know, if young lads coming through, I'd imagine that you're working with now would give the give the give the left arm or something to go and, to go and get to work with these guys week in week out. And I think it's um, I think you should be proud, very very proud that you, you were signed because of your talents to go to Rangers Football Club. But as you've as you've touched on there, it's no easy to break into to be a, a Rangers or a Celtic first team goalkeeper. And there was very big names with it with the gloves at Rangers at your time. So you know, but did, did you ever find mentally it was it was hard to keep yourself up? But it doesn't sound like it was because it sounds like you were going into training. You're probably probably buzzing to train with some of these guys. Yeah, at at times it's like anything else. It's like your career. So it goes through stages where. As I say, at times I was a number three and that was the times when I, I could batter my fitness because you know you weren't going involved and then there was times you were getting on the bench and then, as I say, there, there, as much as I had fortunate things that happened to me previously with Kilmarnock and growing up and obviously think, think getting the breaks and things going your way, there were certain situations where, I think Greg's uh, I I'd been on the bench for four or five games and then the first game I was back in the stand, Greg's got sent off Easter Road so, or, so it's just oh, one of the things where so if that had been a game earlier, then you'd have gone in and you've got a chance to state your, your name in the team, and it, that, that's just that's just football right enough. That's just just the way things go. But as I say, yeah, I mean that was just it was a privilege to be part of that. When I look back now, as I say, you're disappointed when you leave that you've no made a mark as much as you would like to have. But again, I'm when I look back now that I've actually stopped playing, and and as I say. To be involved in, I mean, the the first the first season I was there, we were involved in in the UEFA Cup. I mean, we we played two qualifiers, we played six Champions League games, we played uh, countless games in, in in the UEFA Cup. And as I say, we got to the League Cup final, we got to the Scottish Cup final. I think it was guys in that squad played sixty odd games in the season. Uh, guys like Carlos Queller, Davy Weir and stuff, even at his age. So as I say, fantastic dressing room, fantastic to be part of it, fantastic to be involved in some big games. Uh, and as I say, it was I was very fortunate. But again, there was a time when I had to move on to kind of go back to, to playing. As I say, there's been times in my career where I've been a number one and I've been playing all the time, regardless of illness, injury, whatever. There's been times where you're having to fight about it just to stay in the team. There's there's times when you're a number two and you're desperate to get in the team. There, there's times when I've been a number three through obviously the, the, the stiff competition. So as I say. Now, now I've experienced all that over the last 19, 20 years. Then, as I say, it's it, that's that's where I want to pass on to the younger generation now because anything that they'll go through or anything that they ha that, that they will go through in the future, the 99 percent that I've been through myself. So, as I say, it's it's now I can pass that experience and that and that, that on to them. And as I say, hopefully give them an opportunity to be to be successful as well. Okay. And you were actually on you. You were you were on the bench on the in the UEFA Cup final. Um, I believe that. If I'm right in saying that, that that must have been some experience to be. Yeah, uh, the, the two uh, semi finals. The two semi finals. So Florentina home and away, and the the final. Uh, obviously, and then the Scottish the Scottish Cup. Uh, and as I say, there was a as I say, great great games to be involved in. Great atmosphere. As I say, the the at that point in time, they probably weren't the best to watch, but. Uh, as I said, but a Walter Smith team just never gave in. I mean, we think through that whole campaign, we never lost many goals. And as I say, the, the old saying, "You don't lose goals, you don't lose games." So we were always, we were always in games, and the, with the firepower we had and the kind of strength and depth that we had coming off the bench, and that as well, we always fancied ourselves to nick a goal here and there. And that was exactly how that campaign went. As I say, maybe not the easiest on the eye. It certainly wasn't. It wasn't certainly wasn't Man City or Liverpool or Borussia Dortmund. But again, it's. Nobody cares when you're there and you're winning the trophies. Nobody, nobody going to Manchester was bothering about how we got there. They were just delighted that we did. And as I say, that's just, that's just, that's just football, isn't it? That's it. That's it. How would you say? Um, how would you say? Thank you. You're obviously part of Rangers again. Now we, 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 we're going to go on and, and talk about that. But Maze, I wanted to touch on something just now. How do you? Do you? You're obviously academy goalkeeping head head of academy goalkeeping at Rangers now. How did the time when you were at Rangers under Walter Smith differ from the time under, you know, Rangers are now managed by by the great Stephen Gerrard? How do you see do you see much difference in the way the way things were ran from both managers? Both obviously Walter led, legend legend of Rangers and, and, and did it all. Stephen Gerrard, we're, we're, we're hopeful, you know, there's a big season, we're part of a big season now. But what, what's, your, what's your thoughts on it and the way they they, they might differ? 
Uh, again, just the, the strength and depth of the squad. Obviously, the first team's now getting to that point where, as I say, obviously having a fantastic run in Europe there as well. And, and, and again, it's it's having having the, 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 the bodies that and the, the types of players that... I mean, you, if you look at the campaign last year, how many games that you have to play a different way or you have to play against a different style. And that's when you need your strength and depth. The, the fact that... One, one week you might be playing against a team who just sat in, uh, like so we've seen at the weekend there, then as I say there, there's times where, where teams will play 3-5-2, they'll go, th they'll go three up top, they'll go, as you say, you're going to Europe and you're experiencing all these different players, but as I say, the, the club, uh, when we were there, was the same, it was like, we, we, were, we were quite, we were quite rigid as such in, in the way we played, and as I say, we never gave away many goals, and we, we had firepower at the other end, and and, and I see similarities now, I see similarities now, and and obviously the, the, the gaffer at the moment is adding to that, so as I say, hopefully that, that bears fruit in the future as well, and as I say, we, we get success at the end of it, but as I say, the, the, it's it's a little bit difficult now that I'm no, because I'm not round the first team side, when I was a player, obviously you used to have the young goalies coming round, and and as I say, they would spend maybe half an hour, 40 minutes, and then they would go around with their squads. So we, they would do the goalkeeping bit with us. And, and I'm, I'm trying to get as much as of that out of my older ones as well, because the, ne the next step for them would be the transition with the first team as well. So if we can, between myself and Colin Stewart, the first team goalkeeping coach, so I, I try and push as much as I can on to Colin. Obviously, he, he kind of he needs to pick and choose depending on kind of what day of the week it is, if it's prepping for a game or if it's recovering for the game but we try as much as to get we, we try as much as we can now to get the kind of older guys that are ready for it kind of dipped into the first team training because that's a big bit as well you talk about when I was young transitioning to playing with kind of academy or boys club to then going and playing professional it was it was the fact that see when I was was on training in October school week or something Jim Stewart would throw me into a shooting practice with the first team and for for the first ten minutes, the boys would just be whizzing by you, and you wouldn't have a clue what was happening because again, it was it was experienced strikers. It was Ali McCoy, it was Paul Wright, it was it was guy Andy McLaren, guys like that. And as I say, out of ten shots, you weren't saving any, and you had that bit where you were saving ten out of ten at the youth team. So it's, it's a bit it's a bit dipping in and out of it and saying that that then found I found that intrinsic bit to see you know what right I need to get better here so. You, you you want more of it and you, and you then get maybe get to two saves out of ten and you might get a three and then you might get a four and five and six and then as I say when you then get to the nines and tens out of ten is that's when you're accepted in that company and obviously you you found that bit to go and deal with that so I think now the academies are kind of separated a lot of clubs the, cap, the academies are kind of almost separated for the first team now especially with with kind of conditions at this moment in time with the with the current COVID climate but as I say try to get certainly from my point of view I think that getting the players, obviously they need to be good enough, but getting the players round to the first team and, and, and dipping them into that environment is 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 influential. And as I say, the, the more you can do that, uh, the more you can see again that bit we're talking about, can they handle the pressure? Can they they can all handle they can all handle losing the ball when they're playing with their pals, but can they go and handle the ball in front of the manager? Can they go and lose hand can they go and handle losing the ball or going to win it back or showing their recovery techniques if they're doing it in front of first team players and and the guys that they only see it can again it's a lot of times that they only see the three o'clock on a Saturday whereas they don't actually the more you can dip them into they actually you actually see the, the how much how much hard work and sacrifice is put into a daily week just to lead up to a game. So as I say it's dipping them in and try to give them a wee insight to how, how hard it actually is. And as I say again the ones that ha I've said before, but the ones that handle that are the ones that have a have a better chance of making it. It was good. I watched an interview actually with Stephen Gerrard recently where he said he's all for Academy boys coming through, but they need to they need to earn it. Nobody's going to be getting. Yeah, the, the, the gaffer came, the gaffer spoke to the boys on the first day, and but he came in the door, and, and as I say, he they know the first team staff know through obviously conversations with ourselves and and with the various other staff in the building about what players are doing well, what players are, are doing this, doing that, and as I say, I mean he's had a look at every one of them. Is it again? So it's that bit of there's times where it's it's justified as such and there's times where he, he can get that and there's times where he has to draw away and start preparing obviously for games and stuff as well so as I say the the, the, the more that the more guys we can get through the better but that, that bit of dipping them in and out is, is vital and as I say the gaffers the gaffers had ran his eye over every boy in the academy that's I mean that's that's the one thing that that would probably be similar to Liverpool when you look at them this season that the, the academy's massive for them not necessarily for 
the league and stuff, but when you look at the Carabao Cup and stuff like that, and you look at the, the kind of players that they've kind of they've tried to to put in every now and again, and, and and give them an opportunity to succeed. And as I say, the guys in our building have certainly had an opportunity to to succeed at different at periods. So as I say, again, the ball's in their court. That that they've got to prove that they're at that level. And if they're at that level, the, the manager will give them a chance. And he, has he shown that previously that he, has, he can? Well, good, good, good to hear. So do you, you know, communication wise. Do you, do you get a wee tap on the shoulder here and there from uh, from the gaffer asking what you what you might think about this lad or what you might think about that lad? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I have a good relationship with the first team staff. As I say, there's a I'm in constant contact with, with the first team goalkeeping coach every day. Anyway, in terms of uh, if I'm taking a couple of goalies off him or he's taking a couple of goalies off me, or just the age and stage and the progress of where they're all at. As I say, that's that because obviously my job is to try and get them round to his side of the building on a permanent basis. And as I say, he, uh, Colin, obviously has, has got to oversee the, the the whole the whole thing. So as I say, the I, I'm I oversee basically the whole academy. So on a daily basis, I'm on the grass with the professional guys, the B team guys, and the, and the under 18s. And then obviously, I uh, can I oversee all the coaches that work with the schoolboy academy for the 16s right down. We've got a performance school, we've got a development group. So uh, I need to kind of coordinate all that. Uh, and as I say, there's a we've also got an under eighteen goalie coach now as well, and Connor Brennan has came in the building the last couple of years, so that's been good for me that I can now I'm now in the B team and I can gravitate towards the first team a little bit more in terms of that transition bit. So uh, when the goalkeepers go on loan, we can have a better handle on that, and obviously uh, watch them more and more as opposed to being able to only having the loans manager to do it. Kind of, I can now kind of help him out as well in terms of going to watch all the goalkeepers, which I've always done with academy goalkeepers anyway. I say that's the most important bit that we can we can prep them and give them the tools for being at the right stage and then obviously they can go out the building and, and get that real football that I had with Queen's Park and Stenhouse Muir and that. And as I say, we had, I mean, we had Robbie McCrory out in loan last year playing SPL, who's obviously back out this year at Livingston. We had Kieran Wright playing championship football at, at, at twenty years of age, and we had, a, we had an eighteen-year-old out in League Two. So as I say, that's the kind of that's the kind of pathway that we want for our goalkeepers. And, and again, if we look at even Robbie for the last couple of years, he, he's done League Two, and then he's went to the bottom end of the championship between the South, and then he's went to the, the bottom end of the SPL with we uh, Livingston. Oh, sorry, we went to the SPL with Livingston, who finished seventh last year. So they'll be hoping for a similar campaign this year. And as I say, that's the kind of stages that we want to build up, and and again, that that's dipping them in in and out of that as well. So you you know if they're handling it, if they can go to the next stage, you know maybe if they're not, they need a wee bit more time or or, or whatever reason there might be a circumstance behind it. So I say it's having a pathway and having a and a relationships in place with all these clubs that we can put them in loan. I say that's the most important bit, and as I say, because my job is to prepare them for first team football. And as I say, the the, the gaffers and I'm in constant contact with the first team goalie coach, and I, and again the, the gaffer and 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 Mick Beale and Gary McAllister and other coaches they they're very aware of the academy. They'll nip round and watch training when they can, if and when they can. Yeah, obviously with the European competition, and and previously the COVID there's a lot of kind of lot of travelling about, and obviously there's a lot of coordination needed for the first team in terms of travel and everything else like that, and training times and everything else. So. As I say, there's a they, they certainly know what's coming next in terms of the kind of that kind of almost like conveyor belt, if that's what you want to call it. But as I say, uh, aye, they've got they've got a handle on that. And again, we will obviously at the academy end have just got to give the guys the tools to be successful as possible. But and then the next bits on them, isn't it? Two thousand and nine, um, we've already jumped jumped on to the latter part of your career there with your with your goalkeeping, but you have a. You have a, a big period um, after 2009. You, you obviously made the decision that it was probably, you know, wise for you to go and see, you know, playing first team football. You you went on to play for periods at St Johnston, St Mirren, Peterhead, um, and you finished with Ayrshire Rovers in, in 2018. Looking at that part of your career, it seemed like you had some some great periods, but you also seemed to start getting some injuries coming in as well, which is obviously must be quite challenging. But talk to me about your experience with those clubs. Well, probably early on was was probably the most difficult one because I'd I'd had a great when I obviously had a year left my contract with Rangers and St Johnson wanted to take me in loan and I thought well there's no point me playing well against everybody and then the big games against Rangers that are on the TV I've got to sit in the stand so so I kind of made the decision then to just go and play uh, and so I'd done a great pre season St Johnson's our pre season at Rangers was slightly earlier due to Europe 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 and everything else like that so. 
as I say, I did, I did three or four weeks with Rangers, and then obviously uh, caught up with St Johnston on their pre-season tour, and the very, the very last game over in Northern Ireland, I've went to take a bye kick, and I've just pinged my hand, I've pinged my thigh. Uh, didn't even know at the time what I'd done, uh, and then obviously I got scanned when I came home, and uh, realised I had a seven centimetre tear in my thigh. So that wasn't it. I'd went for no for training and and obviously want to play to then get an opportunity to play. And as I say, I'd done that. So I ended up not making my debut with St Johnson to about the October. We beat Dundee United in the derby in the, in the cup, and 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 it was a I think it was a midweek under the lights at McDermott. We won two one anyway. Uh, and as I say. Then I ended up playing about twenty odd games before the end of the season. I never missed a game for being back in. So already, although it was delayed through an injury, uh, as I say, I ended up playing twenty odd games that year. So it was a, it was a good decision. And then obviously the next year, I had a cut of finger injuries and a cut of wee kind of niggly ones that kept me in and out of the team. And and Peter Enkelman was uh, Peter Enkelman was signed. Uh, so I decided to move on. And then again, again St Martin was probably the most frustrating year because again I'd signed with St Martin to go and play. And uh, all the games, all the normal league, the league games were kicking off on the Saturday. So we were playing, our game had been changed to the Monday night because we were playing Dunfermline who had just been promoted. So on the Saturday training I broke my finger. So so I missed the, missed the game. Uh, I played a couple of pre-season games, did well. Uh, as I say, then broke my finger, So which is just part of the job unfortunately. Just It was, it was bad timing. And then again, I, I just couldn't get in the team basically because the, the goalkeeper was there, Craig Sampson at the time, who I grew up with at Kilmarnock. Uh, Big Sammy had a great, very, very consistent season. So it's just one of the ones where you've just got to sit and take your medicine. You've just got to train train to the best of your ability so that if you're given the opportunity, you do yourself justice. Uh, there's no point mumping and moaning and, and throwing the toys out the pram and going in the huff because you're not playing. As I say, that that's part of the things that I learned when I was younger, where if you're not in the team, how are you going to get in the team? You're going to pr- pr- prove that you're better. But again, any time that Big Sammy played, any time he had a kind of had a, a wobble or a kind of poor game, he bounced right back. And I say that was credit to him. He had, a, he had a quite consistent season, and we had a consistent season as a team. So again, it got to the end of the season, and, and I thought, nah, I need to go. And, but I'm not going to play the next year because obviously it was a kind of fight between me and Craig that year, and and and, and obviously he won that fight. So as I say, it was the next year. I thought, nah, I need to go and I need to go and play. And that's when I decided to to kind of look beyond my playing days and that's when I started doing my coaching badges so by that point I was getting to 30 uh, and as I say the opportunity and a couple of different moves fell through through people not moving on and lack of money which is just part of football so I got to a point where I was I was training with Partick Thistle uh, for a couple of months and, and, and uh, I got to a point where I was 30 in October and I went Ach, I'm not doing this anymore I said I need to go and think about the next step so uh, I, went, I decided to go part time I did offers for part time clubs for the summer but I kind of uh, respectfully declined them because, uh, again, I, I, felt, I felt as if I was good enough to play at the top level in Scotland, which is the SPL. And as I say, I'd been an SPL goalkeeper all my days as such for, for when I left school to join Kilmarnock. And, and I wanted to, to continue that, but obviously circumstances dictated that that I was going to have to look somewhere else to play. So as I say, I'd, I, I eventually... Uh, I'd, I'd been speaking to the assistant manager at Peterhead, who, who stayed quite local to me, uh, David, uh, David Nicholson. So, as I say, uh, spoke to him, uh, and he and he'd be happy. Can you come, Jamie? Come, Jamie? And I thought, no, I'm not going to bother. But by the time kind of November, uh, October, November came, I decided to go for it, and I signed the Peter Head uh, to play part time. And then uh, again, it was it, it wasn't a decision that I wanted to make to go part time, but I, I started doing my badges, and I thought it will give me an opportunity to do my badges and I can go part time. So, as I say. That was when I decided to join Peter Head, and it was a great decision because I really enjoyed my time up there as well. They were a fantastic club with, with great people behind the scenes, salt of the earth people, uh, people that are still keeping in contact to this day. And as I say, they were absolutely fantastic for me and my family and everything. And, and it just worked out that I could crack on with my badges and try and get them get through them as quickly as possible. And as I say, that's how it turned out. And as I say, I think uh, I ended up signing in November, played. So, in fact, Rangers were in the league at that point. Rangers had been demoted uh, to League Two, mm-hmm. and uh, just we daft things again when you look back in your career. So, I ended up playing like 170 games in a row uh, for Peterhead before I kind of obviously I'd played through niggles and everything else like that, but we're far, far easier to manage on a weekly basis when you were part time. Yeah. Uh, so, as I say, I played about 170 games in a row that year. I ended up, I only signed in November and I won Player of the Year. 
and it was just the wee things like we finished second to Rangers in League Two. We're unfortunate we never went up the playoffs, but just I, I actually I think I broke the club's record of, uh, that still stands. I think it was like nine hours or something without losing a goal and just wee things like that. And then as I say, we actually finished with a better defensive record that season than Rangers, and Rangers obviously were were running away with the league. But as I say, just to have that. I mean, it doesn't sound a lot to other people, but for, for a goalkeeping point of view, to have that kind of thing and look back on that, and, and, and as I say, that's the kind of things that, that's why you want to play football. You want to play football to do all, to do all these things, and as I say, uh, to, to do that, and then as I say, I just, the fact that I was doing my badges, and as I say, Peter Head were absolutely fantastic for me, and as I say, I, I really enjoyed really enjoyed my five years. Obviously, it, it finished in a disappointing way of getting relegated, uh, and then I left after that, and that was a season I kind of had a lot of niggling injuries and found myself out of the team. And I was trying to play through injuries, and I, there was actually points where I was only just turning up and playing on a Saturday because I was getting treatment during the week, and and I just and it didn't know just that way. I just couldn't train in Astroturf because because my knee was flaring up all the time. Uh, but as I say, yeah, disappointed how it finished. But as I say, my five years up there, apart from the last season, my 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 years up there, I really really enjoyed. Great club. Sounds like a brilliant, sounds like a brilliant time. Uh, did you have a wee spell at Brayton Rovers before you before you before you retired? Am I right in saying that? Yeah, so so I, I kind of decided in the January when I was kind of struggling with injury and doing a lot of the travelling at Peterhead. I mean, as I say, the travelling at Peterhead was never a bother because they were a great club. They, they used to take you up on a Friday night and put you up in a hotel. I don't think I'd have been able to stay up there as long if I'd done it on a Saturday, going up and down in the one day. And as I say, they, they really looked after the boys for the kind of the kind of central belt and. In the West, they really, they really did. Uh, but as I say, I kind of knew, been around about the January time that my, I kind of my time was going to be up in the summer. I, my, I was out of contract, and I thought, uh, as I say, we didn't we didn't particularly do well that season uh, as a collective, M myself included. I wasn't particularly great. I was in and out, and as I say, diff disappointing with me niggly injuries that, that were normally would have kept me. I would have played, but, but I just it got to a point where it was just too sore. So as I say, uh, we obviously. Moved on for there, uh, and again I'd been at Rangers. I'd been at Rangers kind of uh, for twenty sixteen. So I'd been at Rangers for twenty sixteen as a kind of part time coach. So I'd been doing the kind of school. Uh, obviously when I got my coaching badge, so during the day, so I'd, I'd done the school, uh, the performance school during the day, and I did a couple of the, the academy sessions at night and stuff. Uh, and then obviously there was there was opportunity at that point where. Obviously, Matt Warburton had left, and 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 Colin, who Colin Stewart, the first team goal coach now, who originally held my position at the head academy, he was kind of going to the first team, so I, I kind of did his job almost for a little bit, uh, for for a cut of different periods. Where obviously, when he, when when uh, Matt Warburton left, and when Pedro Cashinia left and stuff, so I was I was starting to get more and more into the into the coaching side of things, uh, and as I say, starting to get more of the, the bug for that. But again. I think it was after one or two games of the season where I didn't have a club and, and I got a phone call from Rafe Rovers and said obviously we're goalkeepers going about for a long time do you, and we want an experienced goalkeeper to play so I again went up there uh, again uh, kind of great season great club just fell short at, at the last hurdle we, I mean uh, I think I played 22 games I had 11 clean sheets uh, we won every game at home uh, we're 100% record at home we had to beat Aloha in the last game at home uh, to win the league for United and we drew 0-0 uh, and we hit the post in the last minute. Well, uh, well, I was, no, I just obviously there's like anything else, you've good games and you've bad games but as I say we were so close and then obviously we kind of faded away in the playoffs uh, and, and as I say it was, it, was a dis it was disappointing but I didn't want to finish on that but as I say because I've been at Rangers for a couple of years and then obviously there was more and more coaching roles were starting to come up and get offered to me, and, 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 and I think about the future, I guess you know. Yeah, I had a couple. Of, I was, I mean, I was, I was starting to make a kind of reputation for myself as a half decent coach, and so there was more kind of. There was still offers. I always said, when I was young, I would keep playing. I would keep playing until my body couldn't handle it anymore, or the phone stopped ringing, and and neither was the case. But uh, because, as I say, I still had a couple of offers to play. Uh, I wanted to go to Wraith for that for that season because it was a chance to go full time again. Uh, obviously, it was kind of Rangers, my Rangers stuff at night and stuff never really hampered any of that, so it was fine. Uh, so a chance to go full time, and then as I say, I, I kind of weighed up my options for, for 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 most of that summer. Uh, 
because I say there was a couple of coaching uh, offers that had been put to me and obviously one of them was head of academy goalkeeper Rangers so again I'd kind of hummed and hawed for a little bit and I wasn't sure and I thought well I, I still want to play I just had it in my head that I wanted to play to 40 but uh, as I say I was I was 35 at that, that time and uh, I, as I, again when I, when I weighed it up and I thought well Rangers is my club it's something that again if I if I knocked it back now and that job never came back up, I would be disappointed in myself. So, as I say, I decided to kind of hang up the gloves as such uh, and, and take up the role. And as I say, it's, it's a role that I've really enjoyed for over the last, well, this is now me entering my third season. Uh, as I say, it's something that I've really, really enjoyed. I mean, it's a, it's a good place to work in terms of the, the boys and, and, as I say, the environment and everything else. And as I say, uh, I've got a great group of goalkeepers that I work with as well. And as I say, I've got a good relationship with the first team goalkeeping coach in the first team as well so as I say it's don't get me wrong the first maybe couple of months and when the first when the first kind of real football started getting played again the league cup sections I thought oh no what have I done here I don't I was getting itchy feet and I was yeah. wanting to play but again I, I kind of made my peace with it and as I say I help out every now and again training by going in the goals and there's a, the, the, the odd charity match and the odd testimonial and stuff like that as well so that kind of well, that kind of you, you played in the Chris Boyd's yeah, so that, that kind of quells my geez, there be things that's, you realise I only played 45 minutes that day, but I'd, I'd, more, I'd, I'd more saves I'd more saves in that game for Boyd than anybody else. Every time he seemed, because it was a testimony, I think I would have let them shoot. It was like, it was like being, a, it was like when me and Boyd he used to go to the back park at training, we, we before the, the bit of rugby park was a hotel and that, it used to be the old training pitch, and as I say, the first team used it on a Friday, and all the kind of youth team used to go out on a Friday and collect all the equipment in, and we'd end up staying for hours because we'd just play, we'd play World Cup and we'd play cross the and we'd play big boy. He would just want to hit a million shots in it because that's just what he loved doing, and I just love being in the goals. And as I say, it was pretty weird that then all the years later you go back and play his testimony, there was many saves again. But uh, I, as I say, the, all the things they get, they kind of. They kind of quell margies when it comes to diving about the goal and it's, when you wake up like a cardboard cut out the next day you realise you're happy you're retired. <laughs> you couldn't do it every day. <laughs> I mean, you know, what a career, what a career. I mean, and, and I, I think you're almost, in a, you're almost in a dream job now after your career finishes. I mean, Rangers are your club. You would, you know, you're a goalkeeper, you're a goalkeeper through and through. You're now coaching the next batch of goalkeepers coming through. It must, you know, I, I mean, I come from a cricketing background playing international cricket but you know I, I have to do other jobs at the moment I, I would love to to get into the coaching world and, and be coaching cricket again it would make it be a lot more it must be it must be a lot easier to get out of bed in the morning I'm saying I, I mean yeah absolutely as I say there's I mean I've listen everybody goes through their careers and they have good bits and bad bits but I mean I've been very fortunate that that uh that my good bits are far outweighed the bad bits, far, far outweighed the bad bits. But again, I don't think that's through luck. I think that's through hard work and, and determination. And that's something that I was always, that's always something I was always given from my dad. And, and as I say, my early coaches where, as I say, that if you want something, you've got to work hard for it. And you might not always get the breaks, but as I say, it's like anything else. You get you get times where things go well for you and you get times where things don't go well for you, but it's how you respond and how you react. And as I say, I'm, I'm very fortunate in terms of, all I ever wanted to do when I was a wee boy was be a professional football player. And when I look at my youth team at Kilmarnock, and we had some unbelievable players in that team. I mean, too many to mention, actually. There were far loads of guys. Some guys only had two or three years at it and, and fell away to juniors or went to college courses in America or other guys had a few more years. And as I say, the, 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 I'm very fortunate the fact that I've played for 19 years and probably I could have played for longer. Uh, but as I say, I'm I'm very proud of that fact, and I'm very proud of the fact that that that, that as I say, I've I was a, I grew up a Rangers fan. I've been a Rangers player, and I'm now a Rangers coach. And and as I say, that's that that that's high up there. With, with, as I say, obviously with, with, my, with my kids and everything else, the fact that I've been allowed to do the three things, being a professional footballer my whole life, play for the club I loved, albeit it was once. Uh, and as I say, now to coach the next batch of the kids, as I say, it's something that I don't think many people have been in the position that I've been in. So as I say, I'm grateful for that. But again, I know that, that I don't rest my laurels. As I say, I always work hard. And 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 uh, anybody that knows me, as I say, from a, from a player point of view or a or a, or a a job point of view, as such we work uh, now coaching. As I say, they, they know what they're going to get from me. 
they're going to get somebody who's honest, they're going to get somebody who speaks their mind and they're going to get somebody who wants the best for the club and as I say that that's that's the way I've always been when I've been a player or a coach as I say that's one thing I learned very early and as I say that's one thing that I've always that's always stayed in me and as I say I think that's been a part of me being successful as well. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. Okay, to finish with big man, a wee bit of question time for you. Don't want you to overthink it too much, just want you to fire some answers at me. Um, who was the best you played with at Rangers? Barry Ferguson. Good, good, good choice, big fan. Did you, um, what was it like to share a changing room with Ali McCoyst? Uh, strange, the, the, that was, uh, again we talk about like upbringing in football and stuff and like young kids now they don't eat clean boots and everything else. I mean we had, we had to clean the whole stadium on a Friday if there was a home game on a Saturday, I mean like wash the dugouts, Queen the, the the bird the bird poo just day everything. I mean, you honestly the the, the, the fro you put the frost sheets down in the winter and stuff like that, and and even that bit now of it's kind of lost a lot with training grounds because there's always new somebody's got that job. There's a kit man or there's a there's a, a laundry lady or something. But you know, that way, you're, when you were a young boy, you had to go in and you had to get all the boots and you had to get the the, the slips and you had to get the socks and the sweaty all the sweaty gear and everything that. And as I say. Guys like Gordon Marshall, who it'd be fair, Big Marshall used to stick up for me even being in the, the goalies union, but I mean Gordon Marshall and, and uh Ali McCoy used to Ian Durant and that, like as I say, they just and, and guys like Tosh McKinley, all, all the guys that had been uh, we all firm and that, I mean they were they were quite witted and as I say, oh, you we used to get in that first team change as a young kid, you get destroyed. Absolutely destroyed. In fact I think I think it was it was Alan Mahood, uh, who I still talk to now, as I say, who do it was when the you ever remember when the royal family came out with Ralph Little, so I just got called I just got called Anthony for two years. <laughs> I'd never I'd never watched the program. Just everybody's called me Anthony, and I'm going, what's he on about? And as I say, no, just one of it. But it's just it's just banner, and it's I mean, it's like anything else. I mean, you could call it bullying. You could call it you could call it bullying now, but for me it was character building. It was done in the right way because as I say it's. Now there's a fine line between what's right and what's wrong, and as I say, there's there's a lot more child protection stuff and everything else like that going on in, in life. But again, go back to my upbringing, I wouldn't swap that for the world because as I say, it was the making of me a man. And as I say, even the daft stuff about getting up and singing songs in front of people for at Christmas and just see the fact that you, you, you're you no scared to be embarrassed in front of your pals. Because how are you going, how am I going to go and train with you guys and shout for the ball or? Or if Ali McCoy is in my team, doesn't matter whether it's a seventeen year old, a nineteen year old, or, or Ali McCoy. So if he misses a chance, I'm going to have a wee pop at him. Yep. So same, same that he would have a wee pop back at me. So as I say, things like that, because uh, that was that was one of the reasons that command how that that was exactly what I'm talking about there. So Bobby Robinson's a manager. So I'm only seventeen, eighteen at the time, and we're playing in a small sided game, and I think. Uh, so Big Jim Stewart had obviously just threw me into the game just to, just to see how I handled it basically and uh, so I've lost kind of one height in your post so the next minute I hear Coy say come on Smitty you can't get beat there so you've got to accept it it's because you shouldn't get beat there so anyway and it's Alan McCoy that's talking to you so anyway so Coy goes up the park and I think he misses one for about two yards goes by the post so I've obviously said cheekily under my breath come on Coy you can't miss that and the next minute Bobby Williamson's heard me and Bobby Williamson said to me, say that again Smitty, and I thought he caught me, I thought he was going to get upset with me. Yeah. And I, uh, <laughs> I don't think he can miss for there, uh, gaffer, anywhere like that. Go and tell him then. So in that way I'm kind of looking at him and I'm going, I can't believe he's put me in this position. So I, I've shouted up the other end to Coisty, oh, you can't miss for there Coisty. So the next minute all the players have, have kind of caught caught me hearing it and they've all kind of cheered and clapped and all that and as I say Coisty took it in the right way because he'd been dishing it out to me and as I say it's, it's them when you can give that wee bit back and, and a kind of jokey and respectful way that, that you end up being kind of accepted in that company and as I say then you, you then know that you can I'm not necessarily saying be a wee, wee bit braver with them but it's just that bit of you know that then if they miss a, if they're shouting at you for something you can shout at them back and they'll no take it the wrong way and I think there's a lot of that now where it's kind of a lot of people don't look at their self. They look at they look at they, they look at somebody else, and it's kind of well, I missed that because he, oh, it was this or it was that. Yeah, and it was, way too much. I, I see. It's interesting to hear you. You say that because there is a and up and up and, and, and you don't like to say in my day and or you and your day because we've all got our different days. But I do notice the youth seem to know take a 
take a wee bit of criticism as, as, as well now. They seem to get really fired at somebody else's fault. And you've got to look in the mirror at yourself. That's yeah, exactly. I think a lot, of, a lot of times now people think correction is criticism. And that, that's the biggest thing, where, where you try to correct people and you try to guide people, but quite often you find it's the kind of, I bought, I bought that, I bought this, and it's like, no, just, can you, can you answer these questions? Did you do that to the best of your ability? Should you have done this? Could you have done that? And it's and it's bits like that where, when you then get to it, you say, all ah, right, okay, I need to look at myself first. I can't go and dig people out, or I can't go and, I can't go and have a pop at people, or, or I can't be blaming this or blaming that, because, again, it goes, but you're, you've, you've got to have your own house in order first, haven't you? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Who was the best you played against? Oh, uh, quite a few to be fair. Uh, as I said, I, I, I played against Robbie Keane, uh, who was who was difficult. Uh, guys like Shot Arvaladze uh, and stuff like that. When at Rangers, Dado Porzo, uh, and as I say, one of the guys I grew up against who always unfortunately had a good record against me whenever I played against him was Big Boydy. Yeah, uh, see all, all the. I'm sure, you let, I'm sure you let you know about that as well. Aye, all the times at the all the times at the back park getting shots fired in at me. Uh, he he just kind of knew where they were, and as I say, nothing changed when it went back his testimonial and all. So as I say, nah, but as I say, I've been fortunate enough to play against a lot of lot of good players, uh, and as I say, it's been it's been enjoyable to be involved in kind of big games, and as I say, the, the cup finals, and as I say, I used to love going to Ibrox and Parkhead and playing, and that was. I always seem to do well in the games. I don't know what it was, just about the atmosphere and the crowd where you would kind of, as I say, you just. I always liked Tyne Castle as well. Tyne Castle was always a good stadium because you just. You felt as if everybody was on top of you, so you almost had that wee bit more to say, you know what, I'm going to keep these bandits out. I'm going to make sure that I don't don't concede here. And just, just wee things like that where, as I say, that was was kind of in the bit, in your in your head all the time, just saying, like, just. Keep them out and keep them out and keep them out. But obviously, when you go to Ibrox Park, it's a bit harder. But as I say, always, always enjoyed playing at these stadiums. And as I say, that's that's what you that's when when I was nine, ten, eleven, kicking the ball at Airdrie, and as I say, breaking all women's fences and that. It just that was what I always wanted to do was play at these stadiums. And I say, I've been fortunate enough to do it a few times. So, come down and listen. Very, should be very, should be very proud, proud of your career. Last question, the ultimate question, Smitty. Are Rangers going to stop 10 in a row this year? <laughs> I knew this was going too smooth. <laughs> uh, yes, they are. As I say, there's, again, the COVID's no, COVID stuff's no helped in terms of everybody's set up. I mean, even Celtic having to go cold, and I know they, they, they win the game comfortably last night, but again, it's kind of... You look at Bayern Munich, the fact that they were the kind of first team to come back, first kind of league to come back and play was the Bundesliga. And you look at how, I mean, I know they've got firepower anyway, but you, you see them at a team that they're seen off by ridiculous amounts of score lines as well. So as I say, it's, it's, like, it's, like, it's like anything else. It's you just want to build momentum and build momentum and build momentum. As I say, you've noticed in the last week, it's the end of the world for Celtic because they dropped Commander, and it's the end of the world for Rangers because they dropped Livingston, and that's just part of. Doesn't matter whether you're a Rangers player or a Celtic player, that's just part of being at the clubs where it doesn't matter whether you're playing Barcelona or whether you're playing Berwick Rangers, you have got to win every game. And every game every point that you drop or every every point that you don't drop or every point you drop or every two points you drop is the end of the world. And as I say, that's it's because it's just a way of life for people. And as I say, it's, it's the be all and end all and uh, and as I say, there'll be loads more twists and turns, that's for sure, whether it's through COVID or whether it's just through performances and, and results, but There'll be loads more twists or turns, but uh, I have no doubt that this is our year to, to, to claim back the SPL. No, I think looking looking from the looking from the outside, you know, looks like brought in a couple of good defenders. It just looks like it more looks like a Rangers squad that I grew up watching. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's getting back to that thing: strength and depth. Strength and depth. It's something that something that that, that rain, uh, Celtic's had for a number of years now, and as I say, through finances and everything else, and obviously. Now, now that the Rangers are, as I say, I mean, you don't, you don't go and play the amount of games in Europe and be a successful in Europe if you're a bad team. Yeah. As I say, and then say, and even the, I know Celtic won the League Cup, but you, can, I mean, it was a disappointing day. Obviously, the scoreline and, and the fact that you've not won the game for how much you've dominated. But again, that's that's the next step in, in terms to put the games in a way. And as, as I say, I think we're at that level now where. Came up, against, came up against a very good team. I was at the first yeah. just before just before COVID. Um, watched the first leg, and you know, 
wasn't the best night for Rangers, but they never played. But but they played. They, they, they came up a very good. Came up against a very good side there. Oh, it's 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 all oh, I've bought some maybes and but when you look at previous seasons where always always that kind of mental mental block against Celtic where it was just it was one step too far. But we're, we're I think we're beyond that now in terms of obviously winning winning in their backyard and as I say obviously leading in January. I know obviously the league the league fell away, but as I say there'll be loads more twists and turns. But as I say we we are we are more than we are more than a match for them now. And as I say there'll be. There'll be loads of the, I mean, the, the size of the squad that the gaffers got. The, again, the hardest thing is keep more of the players happy, but it means that if you get a if you get a niggle, you've got another player of the same standard coming in right away, and you can rest players. And obviously, when you're playing in Europe, then you need to rotate the squad, and you might need to rotate uh, whether it's midfielders, whether it's forward lines, whether it's defenders, whoever. I mean, even you look at the last couple of weeks where obviously Griggs has been missing, uh, and as I say, John McGoughton's come in and been more than been a more than capable replacement. So. As I say, that we've now got strength and depth, and as I say, that's uh, that's going to hold us in good stead. And as I say, I firmly believe that this will be the year that that they will reclaim, but reclaim the SPL back. I agree. I agree. With you. Good answer. I think. I think this is a this is a year that that's enough bragging rights now. The other side of the city, it's time for time for Rangers to have some some bragging rights. And I think the squad wise, I totally agree with you. I'm excited watching from the outside. It looks it looks like a looks like a good unit. And I think Gerard's experience of already having a few campaigns under his belt will stand stand him in good stead. Look, I just want to say to you, thank you very much. Be uh, great, greatly appreciated. I could I could chat football with you for another hour, I'm sure. But we've all got. I'm sure uh, the kids will be coming back from football. Aye, aye. Uh, no problem. It's been good. It's been good reminiscing. <laughs> absolutely. absolutely.